Father in heaven, we thank you that we can be here. I just pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit to be in our midst, and I pray that you would guide my mind as I speak, and I pray that we would come under conviction and that we would be willing to surrender all to you. I pray this now in Jesus' name, amen. The presentation for this evening that I will be sharing with you is entitled, Why Jesus Waits. Here we are on March 22, 2019. It's hard to believe that we as a people have been here since 1844, 175 years. The pioneers who were alive on October 22, 1844, surely could never have dreamed that we would be here on this planet 175 years later. And the question we need to be asking ourselves is, why is Jesus waiting? And why are we still here as Seventh-day Adventists when we have been given a commission to take the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people? And I want to take you to Matthew chapter 25, a very familiar parable. And in this parable, Jesus actually prophesies of the reality that there would be a delay prior to his coming. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 6, we read this powerful parable in which Jesus describes the condition of Seventh-day Adventists just before he comes back. Starting in verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now I'm going to go through this quickly. But it's pretty obvious what Jesus is describing here. His kingdom describes his church, which is described as a virgin or ten virgins, meaning that there are more than one person in this church, and it's a pure church, and they took their lamps, meaning they have the Bible, they believe in the, the truths of Scripture, and based on their study of Scripture, there is an expectation that the bridegroom, Jesus, is coming again, so they believe believe in the second advent, and they are Seventh-day Adventists. And we see in the following verses that some are wise and some are foolish. Those who are wise have the Holy Spirit. Those who are foolish do not. The wise are converted. The foolish are unconverted. Pretty basic, and we understand that. But notice verse 5. It says, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Now, in the Greek, the word for tarried is the Greek word chronizo, which means to be delayed. So Jesus actually prophesies in this parable that there will be a delay before his coming, and he says that his church will be asleep. You know, so many times we say, I, it will be so nice when Jesus comes back. We'll get away from this world of sin, suffering, and pain. And yet, sometimes we don't look at it from God's perspective that maybe it's us that are delaying him rather than he just sitting there waiting for no clear apparent reason. Here we see from Scripture that there is a delay. Some have suggested that Jesus will come at an appointed time, and when he decides to come, he will come, and there is no delay. But Scripture makes it very clear there is a delay. Now, I want you to go to James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, which tells us very clearly what Jesus is waiting for. James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Now notice, the husbandman here is Jesus, and he is waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. 
He's the one that's waiting for the fruit to ripen. And in order for the fruit to ripen, there needs to be the outpouring of the early and the latter rain. Now, we understand prophetically that the early rain was poured out at Pentecost, and the latter rain will be poured out just before Jesus returns. Now, I'm going to take you now to Jeremiah chapter 3, to a verse that is not often discussed when describing God's last day people relative to the outpouring of the latter rain. And in Jeremiah chapter 3, and actually we'll start in verse 1, it says, They say, if a man put away his wife, and she go from him and become, a, become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. So God says, you've been out in the world, you profess to follow God, but you're actually out in the world playing the role of a harlot, but he says, return again to me. And then verse 2, lift up your eyes unto the high places and see where thou hast not been lying with. In the ways hast thou sat for them as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain. Thou hadst a horse forehead, thou refusest to be ashamed. In other words, God's people profess to be his followers, but we have been playing the role of a harlot. And it's interesting when Jesus describes the Laodicean church, in Revelation 3, he says that you have this shame of your nakedness. And in Jeremiah 3, it says God's church refuses to be ashamed, therefore the latter rain has been withheld. And the fruit cannot be ripened if God's church is spiritually naked, playing harlotry with the world. And so God is waiting with longing desire to come for his people, but could it be that we are playing this spiritual role that is preventing the latter rain from being poured out upon us as God's people? Now, notice there's some clear statements that describe this delay as well. This is Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 450. Had the purpose of God been carried out by his people in giving to the world the message of mercy, Christ would, ere this, have come to the earth, and the saints would have received their welcome into the city of God. That was written in 1900. That was 119 years ago. Here we still are. Evangelism, page 695, had Adventists after the great disappointment in 1844 held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming it to the world, they would have seen the salvation of God, the Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts, the work would have been completed, and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to their reward. So again, you see, Christ could have already come. It wasn't his purpose for us to still be here in 2019. Now we see why we're still here. This is written in 1883, manuscript 4, 1883, found in the book of Evangelism 696. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration, and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. Wow, we could have a whole sermon just on unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion. We could do a three-part series on that. But just think about that for a minute, for yourself. Don't think about people out there who don't believe in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Think about yourself as one of the ten virgins who's going forth to meet the bridegroom with an expectation that Jesus will come again, and yet... Could it be that it is your unbelief or lack of faith in the promises of God and your murmuring and your rebellion that is contributing to the delay in the coming of Jesus? You know, a lot of times we shake our heads at the children of Israel, but what are you like 
when things aren't going the way you want them to go? Do you murmur and complain just like they did? Those are the sins that have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. And then we see strife among the Lord's professed people, rebellion. We see this as an issue in Adventism today, and we're not going to go off on that issue per se right now, but clearly we can see strife and rebellion in the midst of God's people. Now, here's another statement, 1901. This is Evangelism 696. We may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination many more years, as did the children of Israel. But for Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with a consequence of their own wrong course of action. The reason that we are here on this earth is not because of God's fault. It's not his fault. It is our insubordination. And you look at a lot of people in the world today and in the church today, and people are saying, I'm going to put my personal conscience over what the church says. Even if they can back it up from the Bible, my opinion trumps what they say the Word of God says, and I'm going to move forward the way I think. And it's that kind of mentality that is contributing to keeping us as a people in this world for many years. Now, let's go to the Bible and see what this world will be like at the time that Jesus comes back. Because thankfully, prophecy tells us that someday God will have a people that will be ready for Jesus to come, and he will come to harvest his people Revelation chapter 14, reading verses 14 through 16. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. The Son of Man here is Jesus. This is the same person as the husbandman in James chapter 5, who's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. Revelation 14 tells us there is going to come a time where the harvest of the earth is ripe, which means that the latter rain has been outpoured. Does that make sense? Now, some may wonder, well then, Is the harvest ripe? Maybe Jesus is just sitting up in heaven and for the last 150 years he's looking at the Adonis church and saying, wow, what a beautiful ripe harvest. I'm just going to let that harvest stay ripe for 150 years and enjoy how beautiful that harvest looks. Is that what Jesus is doing? Go to Mark chapter 4, verses 28 and 29. Mark chapter 4, verses 28 and 29. Notice this is describing what happens at harvest time. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, now in the marginal reading of the King James, it says, when the fruit is right, immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest has come. In other words, when there is a ripe harvest, Jesus isn't going to wait a moment longer. Immediately he will put in the sickle and he will harvest the ripened fruit because the latter rain has been poured out. And in the book of Acts it says that the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey him. And it's amazing to me that obedience has become a negative connotation in God's church today because the devil knows that obedience from a loving, willing heart is what will allow God to to pour out the Holy Spirit and latter rain power for a ripened harvest. God is not going to pour out the latter rain on disobedient fruit. 
God is going to pour out the Holy Spirit to those who obey him because the reality is we kind of have a pride problem in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and you'll have to admit to this, a lot of people want to be centers of influence. They want to be driving the current and setting the, the agenda, whatever you want it to be. And they want to be the person that is in that cycle of influence. And the problem right now is that if God poured out the Holy Spirit and latter rain power, we would take the credit for the work that God is doing. And God's not looking for a generation who will take credit for the power of God. God is looking for a people who will bear fruit that is in the likeness of Jesus. Now, I'm going to read to you a statement from Christ's Object Lessons, and this starts on page 67. The wheat develops first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn and the ear. The object of the husbandman and the sowing of the seed and the culture of the growing plant is the production of grain. He desires bread for the hungry and seed for future harvests. So the divine husbandman looks for a harvest as the reward of his labor and sacrifice. Now, this is where things start to become clearer. Christ is seeking to reproduce himself in the hearts of men. Now, I'm going to stop right there. Notice it's not simply to reflect who he is. It's to reproduce himself. There is a difference. Sometimes I hear people say, oh, well, the reproduction of Christ's character is like the moon reflecting the light of the sun. No, that's not what the Bible teaches, and I'm going to show you that, and that's not what this statement is saying. Christ is seeking to reproduce himself in the hearts of men, and he does this through those who believe in him. Now, let me say this. If you do not believe that Christ can reproduce himself in you, it will not happen. There must be a belief and a faith that Christ really can produce his character in you. And then the statement goes on to say, the object of the Christian life is fruit-bearing, the reproduction of Christ's character in the believer, that it may be reproduced in others. Now, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more tomorrow, but realize that the reproduction of the character of Christ is not simply stopping bad things. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to stop eating that. I'm going to stop wearing this. I'm going to stop watching that. That's all part of it. But what the greater purpose for the reproduction of Christ's character is so that you will be a witness the way Jesus was. That you will bear fruit that will remind people of Jesus. And not only that, so that His character will be reproduced in others by your influence so that we're not simply seeking to gain church members, but disciples who will have the character of Christ in their lives. You know, I heard a sad story. You've probably heard this, but... These, there was this convert that came into the church and he was on fire for the Lord. He loved the Lord and he wanted to share with everyone all that he could about Christ. And one of the well-meaning church members, well-meaning in quotations, told him, don't worry, you'll cool off and be like the rest of us in a few months. That's not the reproduction of Christ's character in the believer. Now the statement goes on. This is... Uh, skipping a paragraph ahead, there can be no growth or fruitfulness in the life that is centered in self. If you have accepted Christ as a personal Savior, you are to forget yourself and try to help others. Talk of the love of Christ. Tell of his goodness. Do every duty that presents itself. Carry the burden of souls upon your heart, and by every means in your power, seek to save the lost. As you receive the spirit of Christ, the spirit of unselfish love and labor for others, you will grow and bring forth fruit. So notice what the spirit of Christ is. It's the spirit of unselfish love and labor for others. Again, it's not not just stopping doing bad things. It means that you develop the love of Christ in your heart so that you go out and find others. 
The graces of the Spirit will ripen in your character. Your faith will increase. Your convictions deepen. Your love be made perfect. More and more you will reflect the likeness of Christ in all that is pure, noble, and lovely. And then Ellen White quotes Galatians 5, 22 and 23, which gives us a very clear description of what it means for the character of Christ to be perfectly reproduced, because we usually just go ahead to page 69 of Christ's Object Lessons, which we're going to get to, but we don't read the verse in the Bible that she connects that to from Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Now, what I'm going to say next is a bit of a a challenge and perhaps a rebuke to what we would call conservative Adonis, if you want to use that term. You know, sometimes as conservative Adonis, we think that if we can show the right theology from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, God will overlook our pushy, annoying, bull-in-the-china-shop attitude where we try to push truth at all costs to gain converts, and people are turned off by it, and then we say, well, I did my part, I shared it with them, and they just didn't take it. And then you wonder why Jesus hasn't come back. It's because there isn't that meekness and that joy and that love and that peace. And you know, sometimes we don't have that love and that joy. Sometimes Adventists, we call ourselves Sadventists. And then we wonder why Jesus hasn't come, and he looks down on his people. He's like, wow, these are the ones that have the, the, profess to have the three angels' messages, and they're grumpy again today. Have another bad day, murmuring and complaining like the children of Israel, and they're not loving their enemies, praying for those who despitefully use them. They don't have the joy. There's no peace There's no patience. We lack gentleness with others. We lack faith in the promises of God. And this is this Laodicean mentality that can develop that says, well, I may have a bad attitude and I may not be very kind, but because I know what the truth is, God will overlook that bad attitude in the judgment because I gave the truth to the people so that they knew what the Bible and the spirit of prophecy says. That's not the fruits of the spirit in your life. This fruit, when it's in our life, can never perish, but will produce after its kind a harvest unto eternal life. And then we get to the famous statement in page 69. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest has come. So what does the fruit look like? A generation of Adonis who have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith. That's what God is looking for. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church, which means he doesn't see love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. He's not seeing it. Maybe there's some sporadic fruits, but he's not seeing the complete picture in our hearts. And you can't say, I'm going to have selected fruits of the Spirit. They all come together. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Or another way of saying it, when the character of Christ, as described in Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, temperance, when that is experienced by God's people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Stop making excuses for your lack of faith. Stop making excuses for not loving your enemies. Stop making excuses for being grumpy all the time and losing your temper and not having patience, not having meekness and gentleness. That is an evidence of lack of faith in the promises of God that he can deliver us from every evil tendency in our lives. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ where all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. 
Quickly the last great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. In other words, if the world saw in us the true power of the Holy Spirit where we had true godly love and joy and peace and patience and meekness and temperance and so forth, they would actually be interested in what we have. But it is the worldliness, unbelief, strife, lack of consecration among God's people that have kept us in this world. Some people look at us and, I mean, if they were to come to some of our church board meetings, they'd be like, why would I want to join your church? Why would I want to give up everything that I have and stop working on Sabbath, make my family mad at me, to join your church that fights with each other all the time? And I'm, su- I'm supposedly joining the truth, and you guys live like the truth doesn't even live in your heart. But when people see the truth lived out within us by the grace of Jesus, this will produce a harvest that will move forth speedily. That's what I'm seeing from the statements that we've looked at. Now, I want to show you from the Bible how this harvest is developed because we see there's a delay. That's undeniable. Jesus said there would be a delay. God's end time people, his seventh-day Adventists, who are going forth to meet Jesus, they are sleeping as Jesus is delayed, but the reason for the delay is not with God, it's with us because we haven't received the outpouring of the latter rain, because we are wandering after the world and thinking that we can have one foot in the church, one foot in the world. We're not obeying the Lord. We're not surrendered to him. We haven't been converted. So the fruits of conversion of the Holy Spirit are not seen in our lives. And so there's this delay. So I want you to go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Verses 23 and 24. And this, to me, gives much light about how the harvest is developed. Now look, a harvest, and typically we describe this as a harvest of wheat, does not develop by chance. You have to plant a seed in order for the plant to grow. The seed can't just be planted in any way, however you want it to be planted. It is planted, according to the Bible, in a very specific way so that a plant can grow and develop into a harvest, not just one plant, many plants. So look at John chapter 12, verses 23 and 24. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now, this is clearly speaking of his death on the cross. Verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, what happens? It bringeth forth much fruit. This is what Jesus is saying. When I die on the cross, I am a seed that will be planted in the ground. And Jesus' life, his perfect life, allowed him to die as a perfect sacrifice. And when he died, that was a seed that was planted. And the promise is that someday it will grow and produce much fruit. And that fruit will be in the likeness of the seed that was planted. And when the seed is ripe, we will have a harvest. Now, interestingly, there's a lot of connections to be made with the death of Christ and the harvest at the end of the world. But I want to read you a statement from Desire of Ages, page 83. We know this statement, but how many of us actually follow its advice? Desire of Ages, page 83. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day 
not each week, each month, each year, each day, in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones, as we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us. Our confidence in him will be more constant, our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with the Spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. This is describing the process of salvation where we meet Jesus at the cross and we we go from saying, you know, I'm not that bad. God, I thank you that I'm not like those liberals out there who don't believe in the spirit of prophecy. I might be mean and grumpy and angry and rude, but at least I believe in the spirit of prophecy. And we're not spending that thoughtful hour and then when the trials of life come, we're not like Jesus on the cross. We're like our worst selfish, sinful self, even though we know the way we should be, we aren't surrendered because we're not spending time with Jesus at the foot of the cross. And the spirit of prophecy says, when we spend a thoughtful hour a day, not out of drudgery, but because we love the Lord, it changes us. By beholding, we become changed into the same image from glory to glory. And it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day. If you wonder why you're struggling with your temptations and in the battles and in the trials of life, let me challenge you and say, this is your assignment to go from the symposium. Spend a thoughtful hour each day with Jesus and contemplate especially the closing scenes and see how it changes your heart and life. Jesus is the seed that's planted. Now, what I want to show you is that there is a direct connection to the experience that Jesus has on the cross in the last generation who will be alive on this earth. And when I came to understand this, I, I think I was down in Trinidad during the two years I spent as a missionary there, and I did a lot of speaking and preaching there, and I remember one day the Lord revealed this to me in my study, and it really blew my mind, and it really unlocked for me an, a clear biblical understanding of what a last generation will look like and how a last generation is possible. Look at Revelation 14, 12. We all know this verse. It says, here is the the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is the conclusion of the third angel's message. After that, we have the message of the special resurrection in verse 13, and then verses 14 through 20 are describing the harvest. And when you look at Revelation chapter 14, the first five verses are describing the 144,000. Verses 6 through 12 are the three angels' messages, and verses 14 through 20 are a description of the harvest. And this is basically how it goes. Verses 6 through 12 the three angels' messages produce the 144,000 who are the harvest that Jesus comes for when they are fully ripe. So it's the three angels' messages with the everlasting gospel that produce the 144,000 who are the harvest at the end of the world and a description of this harvest that is fully ripe that Jesus comes for is Revelation 14, 12 where it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And what I'm going to show you now is that each one of these three elements, the patience of the saints, the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus are personified perfectly by Jesus while dying on the cross. Notice this first characteristic. Here is the patience of the saints. That very same word is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Now, we know Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2 quite well. Starting in verse 1, it says, Wherefore, saying we also have so, we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience. It's the same word in the Greek as Revelation 14, 12. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Then verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Now the word endured is the past tense word of patience in the Greek. 
So Jesus endured the cross, or he had patience, the way God's last day people are described in Revelation 14, 12, where it says, here is the patience of the saints. Jesus had patience, or endurance, on the cross. Now, you know, Ellen White has the statement in Great Controversy where she says, the season before us will require a faith that can endure weariness, hunger, and delay. Now, let me share a confession with you. I could skip my morning devotions, but if I've slept eight hours, and I have a good breakfast, and I go to work, and I'm seeing my patients in clinic, and everything's running on time, and my patients are cheerful and they're thankful for how I'm helping them, rather than complaining about what's going wrong, and it can be a mix on any given day. But if everything's going perfectly, I could be a very nice person to be around without connecting with the Lord that morning. But the question then becomes, what am I like, what are you like when you're tired, you're running late on eating, and everything's running late as well. Do you still have the patience or the endurance that Jesus had while he's hanging on the cross? Realize he's missed a night's sleep. He's been beaten. He hasn't eaten, and he's, la- he's hanging on the cross saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When it says, here is the patience of the saints, it's not simply saying, here are some people that are kind of polite when things get a little bit difficult. No, This is a generation of people who have learned by experience through the fiery trials of life to be like Jesus as he's hanging on the cross, enduring the cross. Jesus plants this seed on the cross and he says, my death will produce a harvest of much fruit in the likeness of the seed that is planted. And the first attribute that we see when it says, here is the patience of the saints, it's another word, here is a generation that is ready to go through Jacob's time of trouble the way Jesus endured the cross. Not only that, it says, here are they that keep the commandments of God. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 7, Jesus describes, or Paul is writing down actually a messianic prophecy from the book of Psalms where Jesus describes himself on the cross. Hebrews 10, 5 through 7. Wherefore, when he cometh unto the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me, and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book which is written to me to do thy will, O God. Now Jesus is saying, I came into this earth and a body was prepared for me to be a living sacrifice to do the will of God. And in Psalms chapter 40, where this is being quoted from, the will of God is clearly defined. Psalms chapter 40, verses 7 and 8, where David says in the psalm, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. So in other words, doing the will of God is God's law written in our hearts and minds. And so Jesus says, when I came to this earth in the fallen human nature that was given to me, I came to be a sacrifice and to live a perfect life and to live an obedient life and to be obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so as Jesus is hanging on the cross, he is a perfect sacrifice because he has lived a perfectly obedient life because he delighted to do the will of God, which is the law of God. You know, it's interesting, sometimes as Adonis will say, well, boy, those Ten Commandments, whew. That, that thing about coveting, if, if, if it just wasn't for that Tenth Commandment, then nobody could know that I had lust in my heart. 
and God wouldn't judge me for it. And so the law is broad. It doesn't deal s- simply with outward actions, but with internal motives. And Jesus could say, I delight to do the will of God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. How many of us can say, I am thankful that I can keep the law of God, or do we find it to be restrictive? Interestingly, Hebrews 10, where I'm quoting from, later in the chapter, we see that the new covenant is God's law written into our hearts and minds. So in other words, Jesus lived a new covenant life. So again, Jesus' death is the seed that is planted on the cross. And when Jesus plants the seed, the seed is to produce a harvest of a generation that will have endurance or patience the way Jesus endured the cross. And it will produce a generation of people who live an obedient life the way Jesus lived an obedient life in the same human nature that we have. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. And the last one, and the faith of Jesus. Galatians 2.20, we all know it, says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the faith of Jesus. So I am crucified with Christ. And when I am crucified with Christ, Christ comes in, sin goes out. And the life that I now live in my human flesh, I live by the faith of Jesus, who is living in me and through me. In order to have the faith of Jesus, there is a total death to self which is renewed on a daily basis. Ellen White has some interesting things to say about the faith of Jesus in the book Desire of Ages. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Now, I'm going to go back here. Humanly speaking, as Christ is hanging on the cross, he cannot see through the portals of the tomb. Hope does not present to him coming forth a conqueror. His sight and his feelings tell him that all is lost. And, you know, a lot of times we have these trials that come our way where we don't see a way out. We don't see a way of deliverance. And we're not sure how God is going to come through this time. This is how Jesus fell on the cross. But then, three pages later, we read, Suddenly the gloom lifted from the cross, and in clear trumpet-like tones that seemed to resound throughout creation, Jesus cried, It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. A light encircled the cross, and the face of the Savior shone with a glory like the sun. He then bowed his head upon his breast and died. Now here is where we often fail. We don't see a way out, and rather than speaking faith and claiming the promises of God from Scripture, through faith we speak doubt and gloom. God is looking to call us to a higher place. Now, what happened? Amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, he had relied upon the evidence of his Father's acceptance heretofore given him. He was acquainted with the character of his Father. He understood his justice, his mercy, and his great love. In other words, as Jesus is hanging on the cross, he's saying, I don't feel the presence of my Father. I don't see getting out of the grave. Sin is so offensive, I feel like he won't take me back. But he remembers by faith his previous experiences with the Father. And that's what got him through. That's why we need to to be developing and having those experiences of faith now. By faith, 
He rested in him. Notice Ellen White makes it very clear. Jesus exercised, exercised faith. By faith, he rested in him whom it had been ever his joy to obey. And as in submission, he committed himself to God. The sense of the loss of his father's favor was withdrawn. By faith, Christ was victor. Now let me tell you something. Unless you think this was a minor little difficulty for Christ. No, he literally, humanly speaking, could not see through the portals of the tomb. He totally felt the loss of his father's presence in a way that he had never felt it before and in a way that is more severe and trying than any of us have ever had our faith tested to this point in our lives, guaranteed. And yet he demonstrated that it is possible to exercise faith when, humanly speaking, you see no way out. Here is what makes the third angel's message so powerful. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, which says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Describe the 144,000, but they also describe Jesus while hanging on the cross. This is the character of Jesus, and it is the third angel's message, and this is to be proclaimed and demonstrated with a loud voice. The reason why the third angel's message has so much power is because the third angel's message is a description of Jesus while hanging on the cross, and it is a promise that God will produce a people who are just like Jesus as he's hanging on the cross. The seed will produce a harvest. Jesus on the cross produces a generation at the end of the world who will be like him on the cross. That is why the third angel's message has power. And it is not only a message of proclamation. It is a message that must be demonstrated. Amen. When Adventism gains this experience, we will see the loud cry of Revelation 18. Revelation 18.1 describes an angel that has great power coming down from heaven, having great power. The earth is lightened or illuminated with its glory, the glory of the character of God as the Holy Spirit is poured out on a generation of Adonis who have learned by faith to submit to the Lord and obey him and who have patience and obedience and faith and who are in the likeness of Jesus. Now the world wants what we have. The earth will be illuminated with the glory of God's character. Now, interestingly, this message comes down from heaven having great power. The earth is illuminated with its glory. It's not simply a demonstration of the character of God, but the proclamation which is given, which is given mightily with a strong voice as Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich with the abundance of her delicacies. And then we see this message that says, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven. There's a last generation of righteous saints and there's a last generation of wicked people whose sins reach unto heaven. And her sins reach heaven, as Ellen White says in Signs of the Times, June 12, 1893, when the law of God is finally made void by legislation. Now let me say something to you here. Do you realize that God is not waiting for the Pope and the president to conspire together to pass a Sunday law. God is not waiting, as the great controversy describes, the, the outcries from the people of America to pass a law that will enact Sunday legislation. That's not what God is waiting for. That will happen when God has a people who will reproduce his character that can give a perfect demonstration with the proclamation to call people out of Babylon. 
And when he has that demonstration, then we'll see a Sunday law. And no, we're not going to be setting dates for Sunday laws. That goes against the clear counsel of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. That is not our message. We do not have a message based on time at this date of Earth's history. Ours is not a message of time. Ours is a message of character preparation and of total surrender to Jesus. We will be able to proclaim the final fall of Babylon when we fully have the character of Jesus. The sad reality is, is that sometimes Seventh-day Adventists go out and proclaim that Babylon has fallen with the character of Babylon, and it doesn't work. Then God will allow the National Sunday Law and the final events of Earth's history to take place, so God uses the three angels' messages to produce the 144,000 of Revelation 14:12. The 144,000 are a reproduction of Christ's character. The 144,000 are able to give the loud cry with power because they are like Jesus. And that's what we need. We need the character of Jesus. Now, I want to spend the last couple of moments here speaking about the vindication of God. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 20 through 23, there's this concept of God being vindicated. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 20 through 23. And I'm going to read these verses here briefly. And when they entered unto the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, these are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of his land. In other words, we can profane or dishonor the name of the Lord by professing to be the people of God while we go out into the world, just as Jeremiah 3 talked about, where the latter rain has been withheld. Notice verse 21. But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen, whither you went. In other words, when we as God's people go out into the world and we profess to be following the Lord, but there's no difference between us and the world, we are profaning the name of the Lord, and it is not vindicating his name. But notice verse 23, And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. When the heathen see that we have been sanctified and made holy in the likeness of Jesus, this will be the vindication of God before the universe. And let's make this very clear. We do not vindicate God. God vindicates himself through us. God vindicates himself through the 144,000. Instead of profaning the name of the Lord among the heathen, we will allow the Lord to come into our hearts so that he will be vindicated and glorified through us. Notice the statement, Desire of Ages 671, the Savior came to glorify the Father by the demonstration of his love. So the Spirit was to glorify Christ by revealing his grace to the world. The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ, is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. God has staked the honor of his name in the great controversy in producing a generation at the end of the world who will be like him. He has guaranteed by his death on the cross that his death would be the seed that would produce a harvest that would be in the likeness of Jesus himself. So why does Jesus wait? Because Jesus is waiting for a generation that we will see fulfilled in Revelation 14, 12, where it says, here is the patience of the saints. 
Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And when Jesus says this from heaven and he has a generation like this, he will have flipped the great controversy on its head where Satan, who was a perfect being in a perfect environment, said God's law could not be kept. And God takes the weakest of the weak from the worst generation who has ever lived. And through his power and our cooperation with him in surrendering to him, he he, through the power of the cross, his death and his love and his sacrifice and his redemption will produce in us the likeness of himself. Isn't that what you want? That's what I want and that's what I need. And by the grace of God, if we are crucified with Christ, this can be the reality in our lives and Jesus will come to claim us as his own. Amen. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you believe that we can be that generation. That you have raised us up to be that generation. That we exist on this earth to be that generation. Forgive us for where we have fallen short. May we be faithful to you. May we surrender to you. May the fruits of the Spirit be seen in our lives. And may Jesus come soon to claim us as his own, is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.